When we attempt to exercise power or control over someone else, we cannot avoid giving that person the very same power or control over us. I found in personal relations of this kind a very wonderful rule, that you never, never show false emotions. You don't have to tell people exactly what you think, in no uncertain terms, as they say. But to fake emotions is destructive, especially in family matters, and between husbands and wives, or between lovers. For if you know what you want, and will be content with it, you can be trusted. But if you do not know, your desires are limitless, and no one can tell how to deal with you. Nothing satisfies an individual incapable of enjoyment. Other people teach us who we are. Their attitudes to us are the mirror in which we learn to see ourselves, but the mirror is distorted. We are, perhaps, rather dimly aware of the immense power of our social environment. No work or love will flourish out of guilt, fear, or hollowness of heart, just as no valid plans for the future can be made by those who have no capacity for living now. Human desire tends to be insatiable. Life is like music for its own sake. We are living in an eternal now, and when we listen to music we are not listening to the past, we are not listening to the future, we are listening to an expanded present. When we dance, the journey itself is the point, as when we play music the playing itself is the point. And exactly the same thing is true in meditation. Meditation is the discovery at the point of life is always arrived at in the immediate moment. You do not play a sonata in order to reach the final chord, and if the meanings of things were simply in ends, composers would write nothing but finales. When somebody plays music, you listen. You just follow those sounds, and eventually you understand the music. The point can't be explained in words because music is not words, but after listening for a while, you understand the point of it, and that point is the music itself. In exactly the same way, you can listen to all experiences. No one imagines that a symphony is supposed to improve as it goes along, or that the whole object of playing is to reach the finale. The point of music is discovered in every moment of playing and listening to it. It is the same, I feel, with the greater part of our lives, and if we are unduly absorbed in improving them we may forget altogether to live them. One is a great deal less anxious if one feels perfectly free to be anxious, and the same may be said of guilt. To remain stable is to refrain from trying to separate yourself from a pain because you know that you cannot. Running away from fear is fear, fighting pain is pain, trying to be brave is being scared. If the mind is in pain, the mind is pain. The thinker has no other form than his thought. There is no escape. The centipede was happy, quite, until a toad in fun said, pray, which leg goes after which? This worked his mind to such a pitch, he lay distracted in a ditch, considering how to run. To put is still more plainly, the desire for security and the feeling of insecurity are the same thing. To hold your breath is to lose your breath. A society based on the quest for security is nothing but a breath retention contest in which everyone is as taut as a drum and as purple as a beat. This, then, is the human problem, there is a price to be paid for every increase in consciousness.
we cannot be more sensitive to pleasure without being more sensitive to pain. By remembering the past, we can plan for the future. But the ability to plan for the future is offset by the ability to dread pain and to fear of the unknown. Furthermore, the growth of an acute sense of the past and future gives us a corresponding dim sense of the present. In other words, we seem to reach a point where the advantages of being conscious are outweighed by its disadvantages, where extreme sensitivity makes us unadaptable. Your body does not eliminate poisons by knowing their names. To try to control fear or depression or boredom by calling them names is to resort to superstition of trust in curses and invocations. It is so easy to see why this does not work. Obviously, we try to know, name, and define fear in order to make it objective, that is, separate from I. What we have forgotten is that thoughts and words are conventions, and that it is fatal to take conventions too seriously. A convention is a social convenience, as, for example, money, but it is absurd to take money too seriously, to confuse it with real wealth. In somewhat the same way, thoughts, ideas and words are coins for real things. Philosophers, for example, often fail to recognize that their remarks about the universe apply also to themselves and their remarks. If the universe is meaningless, so is the statement that it is so. Let's suppose that you were able every night to dream any dream that you wanted to dream. And that you could, for example, have the power within one night to dream 75 years of time. Or any length of time you wanted to have. And you would, naturally as you began on this adventure of dreams, you would fulfill all your wishes. You would have every kind of pleasure you could conceive. And after several nights of 75 years of total pleasure each, you would say, well, that was pretty great. But now, let's have a surprise. Let's have a dream which isn't under control. Where something is gonna happen to me that I don't know what it's going to be. And you would dig that and come out of that and say, wow, that was a close shave, wasn't it? And then you would get more and more adventurous, and you would make further and further out gambles as to what you would dream. And finally, you would dream where you are now. You would dream the dream of living the life that you are actually living today. It is hard indeed to notice anything for which the languages available to us have no description.